When Thomas Moore was defending himself in his trial for treason, a trial that he knew he would lose, and he knew the outcome, he'd be convicted and he'd be executed, the alleged and proven crime was silence, his refusal to acknowledge publicly that the King of England was the head of the church on earth. He knew that he could speak to posterity, and he made the following argument. The argument is actually lifted from the transcript of the trial and was used by Robert Bolt in his play, A Man for All Seasons, and was picked up in the movie by the same name. So you may know these lines. Some men say the earth is round and some men say it is flat. But if it is round, could the king's command flatten it? And if it is flat, could an act of parliament make it round? Now, of course, he was appealing to a hand-picked jury that was paid to convict him, and he was familiar with the system. He had been a judge in a system where jurors were told what the outcome would be ahead of time. So he obviously wasn't trying to persuade the jury of anything. He was speaking for posterity, for us. And it's obvious that the king and the parliament can't change the shape of the earth because of the order of things because the way the earth has formed, either by natural forces or by the will of God, whatever you believe started the Big Bang, is out of the reach of government. So his argument was there's a natural order to things, and even government must be subject to that natural order. This theory of natural order we call the natural law, sometimes referred to as the natural law theory. This was not original. Uh, with Moore. I mean, this had been articulated by Aristotle and even codified by Aquinas. And Moore would be, what Moore wrote about it and said about it as trial would be picked up by John Locke and eventually Thomas Jefferson. So when Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, the reference to by their creator and the inalienability of rights is the recognition of the natural law, that our rights come from our humanity. Now, whether you believe that we are the highest, strongest, most intelligent, rational beings on the planet by virtue of natural selection, or whether you believe we are the highest, strongest, most intelligent, rational beings on the planet by virtue of God's will, in either of these theories, you can accept the fact that our rights come from our humanity and not from the government. This is the theory of the natural law. This was the embraced by every single one of the founders, the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, and it was accepted by most of those who wrote and promulgated the Constitution. Because after we fought a revolution and won the revolution and wrote the Constitution, the purpose of which was to define the government and confine the government, define and confine at the same time. There was, of course, in Philadelphia in 1787, a lot of disagreement over what the Constitution was going to look like. In fact, as you, if you recall your history, and I'm sure you do, the delegates were sent to Philadelphia in 1787 not to write a Constitution, but to offer amendments to the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation, oh, if we still had that today, but of course we don't. <laughs> the Articles uh, of Confederation uh, established the sovereignty of the states with a loose confederation for truly federal uh, purposes, the principle of which in, in that era was defense defense against the British, who they feared would try and take the country back, which of course happens just a few, year a few years later in the War of 1812. So when delegates are sent to Philadelphia and they close the shutters on the windows and they don't let anybody talk to the press, they're up to something. And what they were up to was the crafting of an entirely new government. It was not a set of amendments to the Articles of Confederation. It would become the Constitution of the United States. The Articles actually provided such extraordinary um, uh, independence on the part of the states that the state governments, themselves no saints, half, half of them uh, approved and enforced slavery, uh, nevertheless engaged in such monopolistic behavior and imposed such tariffs that if you were selling wheelbarrows in Hoboken, New Jersey, 
and you wanted to ship them to New York, the tariff on the wheelbarrow when it landed in New York would be such that nobody would buy it from you there because it would cost twice what the wheelbarrows made in New York were. So the tariffs were a very serious problem amongst the uh, new Americans at the time of the declaration, of it, at the time of the uh, founding of the Constitution. Another serious problem was, of course, monopolies. The people who had loaned money to the states to fund the armies to fight the king got themselves elected to the state legislatures. So they were creditors and debtors at the same time. They ran the government that owed the money to them. So they decided that the best way to do this was to declare that certain of their activities were monopolies so they didn't have any competition. So you had the horrific, mon monstrous combination of monopolies and tariffs, and basically that produced 13 different economies rather than one national economy. This is at least one of the theories, an economic theory for the origins of the Constitution. So in order to address the problem of monopolies and tariffs. The new constitution, after much consternation over the natural law and where our rights come from, comes out and is uh, ratified by the 13 states, including an infamous monstrosity known as the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause, which permits the government, the federal government, the Congress, to regulate commerce among the several states is the favorite hook for the Congress today and the courts today to hang their hat on when they want to engage in expansive federal authority. So the original meaning of the Commerce Clause was to regulate the movement of goods between merchants as they cross state lines, stated differently, to get rid of state tariffs. So the wheelbarrow manufacturer in Hoboken could ship his wheelbarrow across the Hudson River to Lower Manhattan and sell it there without being interfered with by New York State authorities. That was the purpose of the Commerce Clause. We know this because little Jimmy Madison, they call him little because he was little. I would love to stand next to him. I'd look like Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> little Jimmy was all of four foot 10. And little Jimmy was the scrivener in Philadelphia in 1787. You see, none of them kept notes except little Jimmy. Little Jimmy's notes eventually, of course, became the document. So after arguing over where do our rights come from and coming up with a compromise, the compromise would be the Constitution will articulate powers for the federal government, but it will restrain the federal government in the first blank amendments. I say blank because the original um, uh, Bill of Rights had 12 amendments, and uh, eventually it was whittled down to 10. After the uh, first Congress was established, Little Jimmy was a member of the House of Representatives from what is now Charlottesville, Virginia, and he was the chair of the House Committee to draft the Bill of Rights. Could you imagine this? He wrote the Constitution and he drafted the Bill of Rights. He was a believer in what we today called Madisonian government. Obviously, it bears his name. And that concept is that the federal government can only do what is specifically authorized to it in the Constitution. Justice Scalia uh, put a sort of tail on that with his theory of originalism, which means that the Constitution, if it is the supreme law, the land can't change with the passage of time and it must mean the same thing today as was the original public understanding of it at the time it was ratified. If little Jimmy and Big Nino had their way, then the Commerce Clause would have its original public meaning, which was giving only to Congress the power to regulate the movement of goods between merchants as they cross the interstate lines. I raise my voice slightly when I say that because today the Commerce Clause, very simple language, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce among the several states, is used to regulate all kinds of things. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find anything in this room from the brightness of the light bulbs to the amount of dye that's in the ink 
that's on the on the walls to the thickness of the cushion on which you're sitting to the strength of the legs and the tables to the salaries uh, that are paid to the people who manufacture everything in this room you'd be very hard pressed to find anything that you can see from where you are now that is not regulable and regulated by the federal government or by some entity created by the federal government under the Commerce Clause. And how did that happen? That happened because George Washington and John Adams were part of the big government party called the Federalists. Thomas Jefferson and Little Jimmy were part of a small government party called the Anti-Federalists. They preferred to call themselves by a name which is really weird to our ears, the Democratic Republicans. I don't know what that would be today, but that's, that's what they uh, called themselves. But for the first 12 years of the country, the eight uh, years of the presidency of George Washington and the four years of the presidency of John Adams, the two of them, Washington and Adams, of course, appointed the whole federal judiciary. So by the time Jefferson becomes president, after the contested election of 1800, uh, the election is thrown into the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives elects him president. He was, of course, John Adams' vice president. They didn't speak in the four years he was vice president. Do you remember how people were elected in those days? Everybody ran for president. Just think of this today. Whoever won became president. Whoever finished second became vice president. Hillary, will you cover that funeral for me today? <laughs> so they didn't really speak to each other because they ran against each other. Uh, Jefferson argued against much of what the Adams government did. He argued vociferously against the Alien and Sedition Acts, which, of course, was enacted by the government to punish speech with which it disagreed. So the same government, the same generation, in many cases the same people that had just written in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, wrote a law that abridged the freedom of speech and punished those who criticized uh, the government. Eventually, the Alien and Sedition Act was repealed by the same people that enacted it because when Jefferson became president and the Federalists were in the minority, they were worried that the Alien and Sedition Act would be used against them. So between the election and Jefferson's inauguration, they repealed this monstrosity. But also in that time period, it is now between January and March of 1801, John Adams appointed Thomas Jefferson's cousin to become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. This is somebody that Jefferson also didn't speak to. And you know his name, John Marshall. Today he's referred to as the great Chief Justice. He's great only in the respect of having expanded the power of the federal government greatly by authoring its uh, original decisions that set the vector of power decidedly in favor of the federal government. So one of the first contests is who gets to decide the federal government's power? Who gets to decide what the Constitution means? Tom Woods has written a brilliant book arguing, and it was a very, very prominent argument at the time. It has since been rejected by the federal courts that the states should decide what the Constitution means and what federal power is because the Constitution came into existence when the 13 states created it. This, this is not a, an argument that's been entirely dismissed. In Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address, he says, let me remind you that the states created the federal government and not the other way around. Now, if I had been the draftsman, I was too young at the time, but if I had been the draftsman, I would have added, and I didn't know him, I would have added this line and the powers they gave to the federal government, they can take back. So, you know, now that's me, that's not what he said, but you do have this debate raging in, in as recently as January of 1981, 
which is Reagan's uh, inauguration. And you do have the articulation out of the mouth of the new president, a recognition that the third word of the Constitution is a typo. It's not really a typo, but it's wrong. The third word of the Constitution is we the people. It should have said we the states because the whole theory was that these 13 sovereign entities would give away a little bit of their sovereignty and create a new central government. And in order to make it crystal clear what they were giving it away, they would write it down. And the document in which they would write it down is called the Constitution. But because of the fear that government would expand way beyond what it was intended to, because it is human nature, power corrupts and absolute power uh, corrupts absolutely. This is a, a lesson of history. The Bill of Rights was added. The Bill of Rights, of course, was intended to uh, abate the voracious appetite of the federal government for power. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Now, I know that we are discussing economics uh, this weekend, and, and indeed, the concept of Western economics is the root and core of all that we do uh, at the Mises Institution. But to understand how the government is able to interfere with free market uh, economics, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Constitution today, and then we'll do this, we'll do this Q&A. So after John Marshall writes in Marbury versus Madison that the federal Supreme Court, not the state Supreme Courts and not the state legislatures, will decide what the Constitution means. The government establishes a bank, and it puts one of the branches of the bank in Baltimore, Maryland, and the legislature of Maryland decides it's going to tax the bank. Now, this is almost inconceivable today that a state would tax a federal entity. I would love to be able to tax the Federal Reserve out of existence. But the... So the uh, uh, manager of the bank, of course, refuses to pay the tax, and a case makes its way to the Supreme Court, and the issue is, does the federal government have the power to establish a bank? Not does the state of Maryland have the power to tax any bank in the state. It does. But does, it, does the federal government have the power to establish a bank? And the government argued that it could do so under a clause in the Constitution, which lists the 16 specific discrete powers, one of which is to regulate goods between merchants as they pass over interstate lines, called the Commerce Clause. And then there's the catch-all phrase, sometimes called the Elastic Clause. And it basically says, to do all which is necessary and proper to carry the foregoing powers into execution. So this case, um, McCullough versus Maryland. McCullough is the manager of the bank. Maryland's the state that's trying to tax it. Construes the meaning of the necessary and proper clause. Unfortunately, it is being construed at the same hands of uh, John Marshall, who said that the federal government will determine its own powers. And so John Marshall wrote, in an opinion unanimously agreed to, that necessary and proper doesn't really mean necessary and proper. It really means needful and helpful. And if they meant necessary, they would have said absolutely necessary. But because there's no modifier on necessary and proper, he dialed it back to needful and helpful. These two cases alone, neither of which has ever been seriously challenged in the modern era, and both of which are so ingrained in American constitutional his, uh, history that those of us who study this and, and practice it and write about it and talk about it take them for granted, have set the federal government on the pace for the massive uh, expansion uh, that we know today. So the states don't decide what power they gave away, the federal government decides what power they took from the states. And necessary and proper because it means needful or helpful has created an entire area of federal jurisdiction never contemplated by the framers. How do we know it was never contemplated by the framers? Little Jimmy. Little Jimmy gave a very famous speech on the floor of the House of Representatives, now known as Madison's bank speech. 
in which he argues, hey, I wrote the thing. Those are my notes. Necessary and proper means necessary and proper, and the federal government does not need a bank in order for it to operate. It can put its money into banks that are chartered by the states. We did that intentionally so as to put a further check on the power of the federal government. It is a great speech if you ever want to read it. It is a masterful analysis of the concept of limited government. It's also an analysis of the Ninth Amendment, which is one of my favorites because it articulates the existence of rights not mentioned in the Bill of Rights, which is the reflection of Thomas More and Thomas Jefferson that our rights come from our humanity and it is the government's duty to protect natural rights, whether they articu are articulated in the Bill of Rights or not. From these two cases, of course, Madisonian democracy, and I use the word democracy intentionally because of the genius among us who is the honoree uh, tomorrow night, and if you haven't read his masterpiece, Democracy the God That Failed, you need to do so. I'll tell you a little bit about that before I leave since I can't be with you or with the great Hans Hermann Hoppe tomorrow night. But the concept of Madisonian democracy, with the exception of the Civil War, when the monster Lincoln destroyed everything that he could get his hands on, the concept of Madisonian democracy survives pretty much until my fellow Princetonian, the former governor of New Jersey, probably the worst president in American history after Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, turned Madisonian democracy on its head. So Madisonian, the government, the federal government can only do what it is expressly authorized to do in the Constitution. Wilsonian, the federal government can do whatever it needs to to address a national problem and for which there is political will except that which is expressly prohibited to it in the Constitution. So these are really polar opposites. And I'm sorry to tell you that every president of the United States since Woodrow Wilson, no matter what the president has said, no matter what the times required, no matter what war was being fought, no matter how prosperous we may have been at the moment, has been a Wilsonian. Now, I don't know if the president, if the present president knows that he is a Wilsonian, <laughs> but he is. He is, in part because he inherits a government that is utterly and truly and overwhelmingly with uh, Wilsonian. I mean, think about the uh, controversy that the Congress is addressing right now, and that is whether or not it should ban these kits that can turn a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon. It would do so under the Commerce Clause by saying it shall be unlawful for any kit to travel over interstate lines. But because the Commerce Clause permits the federal government to reach deep into intrastate commerce, commerce wholly within one state, and because the Congress knows that, it can ban the kits by saying it shall be unlawful to manufacture or possess any instrument that alters materially the operation of a semi-automatic rifle. And it can do that because of the vast expansion of the Commerce Clause, which permits the Congress to regulate anything that affects interstate commerce. So if you, like a famous farmer named Roscoe Filburn in an infamous case during World War II, decided that all the wheat in your backyard would not be sold, it would be ground by Mrs. Filburn into flour, and she would bake it into baked goods for your family. Can that be regulated by the federal government? Answer, yes, because by not putting that wheat into interstate commerce, there was theoretically an effect on interstate commerce, and since Congress can regulate anything that affects interstate commerce and can regulate what Roscoe Filburn does with his wheat in his backyard. Justice Scalia, before he died, told me one of his goals before he would die, he didn't achieve this, would be to, uh, to overrule that infamous case called Wickard against Filburn. It, too, has expanded the commerce power. Think about it. The government can regulate your behavior for not engaging in interstate commerce, because if you did, then that behavior would be regulable. 
Now back to the kits on the guns. I'm not going to talk to you about guns. This is not, not an argument about guns except to say that the purpose of the Second Amendment is not to protect your right to shoot deer. It's to protect your right to shoot tyrants when they take over the government. And, and we know that because the drafters of the Second Amendment had just used their weapons to shoot and kill tyrants who were the agents and the soldiers of the British king. And there was no qualm about doing so. But the gutless wonders in the Republican Party today have decided there's a way to get rid of these kits that turn automatic weapons into uh, semi-automatic weapons into automatic without having to vote. Why don't we just get a federal bureaucrat to promulgate a regulation invalidating the kits? So prediction, prediction. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is not responsible or answerable to the people, none of whose agents, servants, employees, or masters has run for office, will promulgate some rule which will allow the Republicans to say, ah, see what we did, see how we responded to the crisis, but also say to their friends in the NRA, we didn't vote for anything that harmed you guys. This was done by a bureaucrat. It's very interesting as to whether these kits are even lawful because the uh, Justice Scalia's opinion in Heller, that's the case that defines the right to keep and bear arms as a personal, individual, pre-political right, not as some collective right. Pre-political, a secular phrase for natural because it is the right to self-defense. Justice Scalia actually defines it and says it is the right to own, carry, and use a weapon of the same technological proficiency as those owned by the bad guys and government officials. I see that my time is, uh, is drawing to a close, at least for this portion of the program. I'm, I'm going to summarize all of this for you after Tom and I uh, finish the Q&A. But here's something to, to ponder, and maybe this will come up in the questioning period, and this is, this, is Hans, this is Hans's work. Is democracy worth it? Is democracy inherently so flawed that people will use democratic forces to steal property that they otherwise couldn't steal because we'd have the ability to resist. You know, I live in New York and New Jersey. These are the two highest tax states in the union. When the tax man comes for my collective burden of 60%, I can't resist the tax man. I mean, if I do, you know what will happen to me. You'll never hear from me again. I'll shave my head and I'll live like a cretin in a cage for defending my own property. But there's, there's something about democracy where the government keeps increasing and liberty keeps decreasing and the people get in the government so that they can tell everybody else how to live and take everybody else's property. And Murray Rothbard, another uh, a person we honor this weekend, had a funny one-liner about government. So I can't take credit for this, though I've modified it slightly. You're sitting at home one night, you're relaxing, you're reading The Road to Serfdom, <laughs> or you're reading The Revolution by Ron Paul. There's a knock at the door, you open the door, there's a guy with a gun. Guy says to you, give me your money. I want to give it away in your name. You call the police. He is the police. <laughs> He's the tax man come to collect his due. So Murray used to argue, there are only three ways to achieve wealth in the Western world. One is by inheritance. God bless you. Somebody died and left you a nice farm, a nice piece of property, a lot of money. 
do the right thing with it, keep it away from the government. <laughs> or, or, like, or like most of us, you work hard, the sweat of your brow, your intellect, your muscle, your hard work, you trade what good, what service you have, what good you can produce for somebody who's willing to pay for it. That's the economic model. And then there's the mafia model. Give me your model or give me your money or else. And then Murray says, which model does the government use? Jefferson and, and Adams, uh, notwithstanding their bitter relationship in the early part of the 19th century, they died on the same day. They would live another 30 years after they left politics, and they engaged in great correspondence. One of the most telling things you can read are the letters of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And in those letters, among many other things, Adams, John, uh, or, uh, Jefferson predicts that on the long march of history, government will expand and liberty will shrink. And Adams, who was one of the big government people in Philadelphia, basically concurs. So what do we do about it? Well, we have to be very, very courageous. We have to educate the people that we send to Washington, a difficult task to do when there's really only one political party, the big government party, with a Democrat wing and a Republican wing. But we have to get in their faces we have to make sure that the words and the energy of a, a guy like Ron Paul are put in the front of the noses of everybody to whom we have given the power to affect our lives. And we have to make sure that people understand that uh, human liberty lies in the heart. And as while it lies there, no government, no majority can take it away. But like any good muscle, it must do more than just lie there. Okay, we'll take some Q&A. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, it comes from, I believe it's Jeffrey Rogers Hummel's book, Emancipating Slaves and Enslaving Free Men. And I believe it's in that book, in which he says that the libertarian revolution of 1776 died a borning 90 years later in the middle 1860s with what some would call the war of northern aggression. Comments, pro, con, or other? Well, I think he stated a truism and a statement that doesn't even have to be proven. It's so, uh, it's so obvious. Uh, Murray Rothbard argued I guess he said this around 1995, the last moral war ever fought was the American Revolution in 1776 because it was, it was literally a war to repel uh, a tyrant. And, uh, you know, the Civil War, you shouldn't hesitate to call it the War of Northern Aggression. I honestly thought you were going to say the, the revolutionary dreams died in Philadelphia in 1787, which is just 11 years later. Now, it's not until 1789 that the Constitution is ratified, and then in 91, the first 10 amendments, what we call the Bill of Rights, uh, was added. But it was certainly in that secret room in Philadelphia where little Jimmy's words were twisted and tortured well out of proportion of what he uh, intended. I can't help going like this when I say little Jimmy. <laughs> Um, uh, that the long march towards big government uh, began. Uh, it is certainly on its deathbed by the end of the War of Northern Aggression, and it has been executed by the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, the young man, said that they hand out copies of the Constitution. I, I'm assuming it's one of those booklets with the Declaration of Independence in it as well. Woodrow Wilson had federal agents arrest people for reading the Declaration of Independence out loud on public street corners across the street from draft offices, particularly the part that says, when the government is not responsive to the will of the people, it is their duty to alter or abolish it. And when he was confronted in court with the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, he said, I don't, I don't question that. I'm not Congress. It doesn't restrain me. I'm the president. And these people were incarcerated, and they stayed in jail until the end of World War I for reading aloud the, the document that you distribute. 
My question to you, uh, uh, Judge, is not only the uh, Constitution and the government's the only one supposed to be able to create law, now they have agencies. Now they've gone one step further, they've got SROs like FICA, and, and that regulates a banking that are beyond the reach of the government, basically putting to, you know, destroying the banking industry, besides whatever you think about it. And then there are other SROs that allow the government. So not only do you have the government, you've got your agencies, and then you've got your SROs, and Justice uh, Scalia, in a uh, case uh, challenging the constitutionality of the independent counsel law, this is not the same law under which Robert Mueller was appointed to investigate President Trump and his folks, but an actual statute that existed at the time. And he, the, the court found the statute constitutional. Uh, in, in that era, the attorney general went to a panel of three judges and said we needed an independent prosecutor to prosecute some of the executive branches. Scalia said it doesn't make sense because delegated power and all federal powers are delegated. None is original with the federal government under the Constitution. Delegated power cannot be delegated away without the permission of the person who originally delegated it, stated differently. If the Congress wants to create some entity to make laws or rules, whether it's the Food and Drug Administration or the Federal Reserve or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, it needs the permission of the states. That was at least Scalia's theory, Justice Scalia's theory in this dissent. It's the dissent. It's not the, uh, it's not the majority opinion. But the, the majority opinion, of course, the rule of unintended consequences, has uh, created an enormous proliferation uh, of agencies and administrations and subgroups that are able to do whatever they want because they're not um, accountable to the people, uh, to the voters. They're not accountable to the states. They're not accountable to the Constitution. The only time their behavior is scrutinized is when you can get them in court, and it's very difficult to get them into court. Why? Because every one of these agencies is vested with discretion. So the threshold of challenging an agency ruling is that it abused its discretion, that it went far beyond what Congress intended it to do, a very, very high bar uh, to reach. The Supreme Court just uh, ruled recently that the EPA abused its discretion by characterizing a mud puddle as some sort of a navigable water. I'm exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> Wasn't any bigger than this stage is a navigable water that they can uh, regulate. Judge, so the, so the, the monster government gets away with so much by keeping it all below the radar screen. Are you familiar with a professor at Columbia Law School, Professor Hamburger? Yes, Professor Philip Hamburger who on this issue is very much one of us, is the world's foremost authority on the abuses of the administrative state, which is the phrase that those of us in the legal community refer to uh, this vast array of federal regulatory uh, bureaucrats, the administrative state. We have the warfare state, we have the welfare state, we have the deep state, the most pernicious of all. We also have the administrative state. Uh, Professor Hamburger has about a thousand page book. I mean, it's, it's a doorstop, but it is everything you need to know on the, it's re relatively new. It's only about eight or nine months old. It's everything you need to know on the evils of the administrative state and how all these uh, awful bureaucrats acquired their almost unreviewable power. I can't believe I even asked the question. All right, who has the portable microphone? Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how uh, how comes the travesty of civil asset forfeiture continues to pass c uh, constitutional muster? Well, it doesn't pass constitutional muster, but it enriches the government. So civil <laughs> a civil asset forfeiture. It's a long story, but I'll be I'll be very brief. There's two versions of it. There's state civil asset forfeiture and federal. Basically, civil asset forfeiture is the is the seizure of of a criminal defendant's assets before he's been convicted. And maybe even he's never been convicted, but the state still gets the asset. Most states have done away with that. The federal government has not. The federal government continues to seize assets at the time of indictment. Their favorite gig is to indict somebody wealthy enough to hire the best team of lawyers, but seize his assets so that he can't, uh, he can't pay the uh, lawyers. 
uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has basically said to the state police that in states that have prohibited civil asset forfeiture, we'll deputize you as federal agents. You can go ahead and seize the property. Now, why do cops like to seize the property? They get to use it for themselves. So I'm sitting at a bar one night and a guy comes up to me, he's Judge, how are you? It's a former prosecutor of the county in which I was a judge. He introduced me to his wife. And the wife said, oh, this is the judge that stole the car from you. Now you think, I stole a car from a prosecutor? What the hell is this all about? <laughs> so the state police dragged this kid into my courtroom and they said, well, he was caught uh, transporting um, a prostitutes across the George Washington Bridge uh, and uh, we seized this Mercedes Benz. I said, wait a minute. Is he even charged with the crime yet? Well, no, but we saw him doing it, so we seized the Mercedes Benz. Where's the Mercedes Benz? Uh, the county prosecutor is driving it. <laughs> you guys work for the county prosecutor? Yes. I want the keys to that Mercedes Benz on this bench in an hour, or we're going to arrest the county prosecutor for driving a stolen Mercedes Benz. I, no, I, to, I told you I told you the second half of the story first because the police literally under the federal rule get to keep 80 percent of what they steal yes judge, sir judge Napolitano do you uh, foresee any possibility that you might be on the Supreme Court Where's Austin Peterson? Is he in this room? <laughs> now, Austin Peterson worked for me in the two happiest years of my life when I had a show on Fox called Freedom Watch. <laughs> and and Aus Austin was one of my producers, and he was, of course, the rabble rouser, just to make sure I stayed Rothbardian. He is now a candidate for the United States Senate from Missouri. So you should ask him if he will vote, if he would vote to confirm my nomination to the Supreme Court. It's a, it's a flattering question, but not one that one can dwell on for longer than I just did. All right, all the way in the back, Michael. So this one is for either or both of you, but what do you think of the idea of Hoppians, Rothbardians, Misesians coming together to bring the fervor of the Ron Paul revolution to inject ourselves and organize and inject ourselves into the Libertarian Party, a Mises caucus within the Libertarian Party, so to speak? All right, now this, this question is a plant. I only say that jokingly because the young man who asked it uh, and I discussed this at great length at, uh, at a conference, a money conference in uh, Aspen, Colorado just uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the Libertarian Party in the United States, of course, was at its height when Congressman Paul uh, was its nominee, and it has not been anything but a shadow of itself since then. Is the question, could the Libertarian Party, if properly injected with the right energy and ideological and intellectual fervor and cash, ever seriously compete against the Republican Party? Absolutely it can. Absolutely. Not if it nominates people like the nominees the last two times around, but if it nominates people like the Thomas Jefferson of our era, Ron Paul. All right, the new rule is if you've asked the judge the question within the past two weeks, <laughs> you can't ask it here. All right, yes, sir, in the back. Let me check the time. Judge, why are all these so-called conservative radio talk show hosts promoting a convention to amend a constitution that is currently inoperable? Why are they so hyped up about this? And does it make you a little suspicious about what they would do to what's left of the Constitution? Well, the last time we had a convention, we thought it was going to amend the Articles of Confederation, and we ended up with a monstrosity that produced the God that failed. Uh, I think they think 
they can put Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer out of business overnight, but they might be replaced with people equally as big government, just their version uh, of big government. I don't think that's going to happen. Are you speaking of the um, Article Five? No, I, I know, I know, but the, there, there's many, there's many groups out there. There's one which is the best organized and actually has resolutions from about 18 or 19 state legislatures uh, requesting the uh, requesting the convention. I don't know if it's going to be successful, but if it is, we have to get ourselves elected as delegates, and I'd be happy to become the chair of that convention. So let me. I think we can do one more. Can we sure. do one more? Okay, can we get the microphone all the way over here? Oh, wait, is it Austin Peterson with a question? Do you really have a question? You have a question for the I judge? Do, and as the next senator from Missouri, I would gladly vote for the There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I have an important question. I think it's sort of the elephant in the room. Is uh, The biggest challenge on my campaign right now is uh, that the Republican Party has strayed away from the old Reaganite and Bush traditions of being a welcoming uh, uh, party towards immigration, and now we're very much a sort of build the wall, sort of a restrictionist view on immigration. How should libertarians view immigration? How should we uh, sell our ideas to the American people? What is the true libertarian view on immigration? I don't know, a, a good question, Austin, uh, or Senator Peterson. <laughs> I, <laughs> sounds nice. I don't know that there is a true libertarian answer, and even though I, I know even on the Mises board, even within our Mises, within our Mises family, uh, we disagree. I mean, four people over from you, the guy with the beard and the bald head is the, the most libertarian person in the room, including me. And he, that is, that is Professor, that is Professor uh, Walter Block of Loyola University, New Orleans, and he and I, uh, disagree. My own view is that the right to travel is a natural right, and it's none of the government's business where you want to go. But I don't think that that is the strongest political argument. I think the strongest political political argument is one from compassion, like the the kids that came here as babies at the hands of their parents, and now are are young adults and as Americanized and as vetted as any group of immigrants ever could be or ever has been, It'll take a very, very cold, harsh, nativist attitude, we're better than you because we got here before you, to justify kicking them out. So that's, that's where I uh, come down on that. When I, uh, I'll just uh, bring this to a close because I know we all have other things to do, address young people, I sometimes use humor and sometimes use fear, so a little bit of humor. I am seated in my office one day and the phone rings and the screen lights up and the screen means the name of the person calling. You all know this person. His office is two doors from mine. What the hell is he calling me for? Stossel. All right, Johnny, what is it? Well, I have to go on O'Reilly tonight and I don't want to go. Can you take the gig? What are, you, what are you, crazy? You want me to go down there instead of you? Why, why don't you want to go? Well, because the issue is drones and I don't know anything about drones and you're a little better on this topic than I am. Can you go? I said, well, I can go, but we'll both get fired or at least disciplined somehow. But let me send you some stuff to read on drones and call me back. So I sent him some things to read. He calls him back. OK, I get it. I get it. I get it. President can't kill people. Uh, due process. The government wants life, liberty or property. They have to sue you for it or try you for it. Only the Congress can declare war. I understand that. But I don't want to go. Something's going to happen. Johnny, I can't help you. Next morning, I come in. Phone rings again, he calls, Johnny, what happened? Well, I went down to the studio where they told me to go, O'Reilly's studio, and no O'Reilly. No O'Reilly, no O'Reilly. They didn't tell me this. He was in Los Angeles before a studio audience of a thousand people. Soon as I sat down in his studio in New York, my face, is Stossel speaking, shows up on the flat screen, 10 times life size, and O'Reilly starts, all right, Stossel. What's wrong with drones? <laughs> Kills the bad people, saves the good people. Half the time, we don't even know that these creeps are dead. John goes, yeah, that's true, that's true. But the president can't kill whoever he wants. 
and he can't start a war on his own. And the Constitution says only the Congress can declare war. And if the government wants life, liberty, or property, it has to follow due process. Otherwise, Bill, the president could use a drone to come after you. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Stossel. Did you get these arguments from Judge Napolitano? <laughs> Stossel goes, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. <laughs> Big deal. He's not on the Supreme Court. The best he can do is Fox and Friends. <laughs> so you have to have, I mean, I sent that to Roger Ailes, uh, our boss at the time, and he watched the clip. He called me back. He goes, it's the funniest thing I've ever heard come out of O'Reilly's mouth. <laughs> You have to have not only a thick skin, but a sense of humor. My uh, hero, St. Thomas More, as he was about to be executed, uh, said to the executioner, you know what, I need a little bit of help going up the scaffold, but I won't need any help coming down. <laughs> yeah. I uh, expect that I will die when I do, faithful to my first principles, to our first principles, in my bed, in my house, surrounded by people that love me. But not all of you, particularly the young people, will have that luxury. Some of you will die in a government prison, faithful to first principles. And some of you may die, faithful to first principles, in a government town square, to the sound of the government's trumpets blaring. When the time comes to make that horrible decision, stay faithful to first principles or give in to the government, you will know what to do. Because freedom lies in the human heart. And while it is there, no tyranny of the majority and no tyrant can take it away. But you must exercise it. It must do more than lie there. Thank you and God love you.